I want to talk to you for the next probably 40 minutes or so about uh, economic growth and leave some time for uh, questions and discussion at the end. Economic growth, of course, is a subject that is near and dear to the hearts of politicians and economists. We're always uh, encouraged to think that economic growth has been going on for a very long time that it's always a good thing and that it will continue for a very long time into the future. I'm going to challenge all three of those assumptions this afternoon and uh, discuss a bit about what that means for New Zealand's economy and explore with you uh, what the future might hold uh, in terms of life after growth. So first of all, the assumption that economic growth has been going on for a very long time is questionable. If we measure economic growth in terms of GDP, as is customary, gross domestic product, which is basically the amount of money spent in a national economy annually, which in turn is, is a pretty good marker for consumption, then uh, we see that going back over the last several hundred years, there was basically zero economic growth until we get just to the last couple of hundred years. Now, the last couple of hundred years are also anomalous in terms of population growth. We went from under one billion at the beginning of the industrial period in 1800, and we're now up to over seven billion human beings on planet Earth right now. So that's an extraordinary rate of population growth, again, absolutely unprecedented in human history. And both of those correlate with a third trend, recent trend, which is a dramatic increase in energy consumption. And I'm going to argue in just a few minutes that this third trend is actually crucial in understanding the first two. But before we get there, I do want to pay my own homage to the authors of this book, Limits to Growth, which was the best-selling environmental book of all time. I read it when, when I was 21 years old, and I realized for the first time in my young life that the world was on an unsustainable course. Uh, the standard-run scenario, of course, this was a, a computer uh, scenario study, so it was looking at uh, the likely interactions between population growth, resource depletion, and environmental pollution. The standard run scenario, as Jeanette mentioned, showed a peak and decline in world industrial output sometime in the first half of the 21st century, and then a decline in population uh, soon afterward. This, of course, was a very unwelcome message in the early 1970s. And the, 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 uh, the report and the book were roundly criticized by mainstream economists who believed that there were no limits to growth. Now, more recently, the uh, Commonwealth Scientific and Industrial Research Organization in Australia, CSIRO, did a retrospective study of the limits to growth scenario uh, scenarios, and they found, as, as you can read for yourself, that the standard run scenario is actually closest to the emerging data over the last uh, few decades. So the good news is we're right on track. <laughs> now, uh, as, I, as I mentioned a moment ago, I, I want to bring this up to date. And, and discuss what it means for New Zealand. But I'm going to use somewhat different baskets of factors than were used back in 1972. Back in those days, there was not as much discussion about the financial system and its possible contribution to uh, our hitting the, the limits to growth. But I'm going to suggest that limits to debt are, are going to be just as important as limits to resources and, uh, and environmental pollution. So here we go. Let's start with energy. As I mentioned a, a little bit earlier, energy is crucial for understanding all of this. Why? Because energy is necessary for everything we do. Very often economists will say that energy is 
10% of the economy because we spend roughly 10% of GDP on, on energy. But that hardly captures it because if, if the electricity goes off and the petrol pumps run dry, the economy doesn't contract by 10%. The economy stops. So really, energy is at the base of all economic activity. It's at the heart of the economy. For centuries and millennia, we used basically renewable energy sources. That changed with the Industrial Revolution, where we gained access to energy sources that, that had been formed and concentrated by nature over the course of tens of millions of years through process, processes that we had to invest no effort in ourselves. Uh, <clears throat> of course, there were some prerequisites. We had to develop metallurgy and gears and, and mining equipment and then a simple heat engine. But once we had done those things, all hell broke loose. Uh, think of it this way. Maybe you've had the experience of running out of petrol in your car and having to push your car a couple of meters off to the side of the road. That's hard work, right? Well, now imagine pushing your car for kilometer after kilometer after kilometer. A single liter of petrol contains the energy equivalent of weeks of hard human labor. Now, it's hard to specify an exact number of days because, of course, it depends on, you know, how big the person is who's pushing the car and whether they're using their arm muscles or leg muscles and so on. But it's, I think it's defensible to, to use a nice round figure of one month hard labor, energy equivalents of a liter of petrol. So how much are you paying for a liter of petrol in New Zealand right now? Just a little over $2.00. So think about that. A month's labor for two dollars, that's a bargain, isn't it? Well, that's, that's why we have mechanized every process of production and transport that we possibly could over the past 200 years. It's given us enormous economic benefit. When we hear about labor productivity, we're not really talking usually about people working harder and longer. Generally speaking, we're talking about people using more fuel-fed machinery to accomplish more work than they could do with their hands. But the most economically significant of the fossil fuels is oil. And oil is, well, like the other fossil fuels, a finite resource. But the, the finitude of oil is playing out right under our noses. And I, so I'm going to focus on that, the whole, the whole discussion about uh, peak oil, and start that discussion with my home country, the United States, because that's where the oil industry got its start. Uh, the, the U.S. has drilled more oil wells than the rest of the world put together. Uh, the industry started in 1859, and for decades afterward, the U.S. was not only the world's foremost oil producing nation, but the world's foremost oil exporting nation. And by a large measure, in many years, half the world's oil was coming from wells in Ohio, Pennsylvania, uh, Louisiana, Oklahoma, California, and so on. Well, discoveries of oil reached a peak around 1930, began to decline. Actual U.S. oil production has been generally declining since 1970. We've had some good years and some bad years. The U.S. is actually having a bit of good luck right now, maybe a little bit more about that later. But if the U.S. is a template, then we're seeing that template being followed by country after country. Uh, nations that used to be oil exporters are becoming oil importers. That's true of Indonesia. It's true of Great Britain. Uh, and world oil discoveries have generally been declining since about 1964. Actual world crude oil production has been stuck in neutral since 2005. Now, if you add in biofuels and propane and butane, you can nudge that, that line up at the end there a, a bit. But uh, those things are, really shouldn't be put in the same category as oil. They're, they have very different energetic and economic properties. Uh, 
So if we just consider crude oil, something strange has happened in the oil industry. Rather than production continuing upward and upward, it's stalled out for seven years now. Well, why is that? Uh, it's because the oil industry itself has changed. It used to be that we found oil in shallow onshore reservoirs that were easy and cheap to produce. That's not the case anymore. Uh, a single ultra-deep water exploratory well can cost a half billion dollars to drill and still come up empty. So the industry needs much higher oil prices to justify going after tar sands or uh, tight reservoirs in, in North Dakota or ultra-deep water oil. It's not like the old days. Uh, well, here's your situation in New Zealand. Using more oil, generally speaking, on an annual basis and, and importing basically all of it. Uh, well, get in line. There are more oil importers every year and there are some bullies who are elbowing their way to the front of the line. In case you are not familiar with these figures, it's nice to just have it visualized. Okay. Well, let's get back to oil. Uh, as I mentioned earlier, oil is, is central to the economy because it's, it's virtually all of our transport energy. And transportation and trade are very, very closely linked, obviously. Well, we see that visualized here. Uh, this is U.S. data, recession since 1970, and the oil price since 1970 in inflation-adjusted terms. As you can see, every time there's been a price spike in oil, there's been a recession. Now, we have had a recession or two that don't appear to be correlated with high oil prices, but the converse is not true. We haven't had a situation of spiking or persistently high oil price that wasn't associated with a weak economy. So here's our dilemma in a nutshell. The industry needs oil prices at $100 a barrel or more to justify bringing on a new barrel of oil's worth of production capacity. If demand for oil ceases, if, if demand for, well, ceases is too strong a term, but if demand for oil dramatically declines, well, we could get by with some of the already uh, drilled, cheaper to produce oil in the world, and, and uh, that ex effectively that's what happened in late 2008 after oil prices spiked up to $150 and the, and the economy then went into a tailspin, then demand for oil suddenly dove and the price of oil went back down to $35. I'm not suggesting that the price of oil will never decline again. It may very well do so. But if it does, it will happen in the context of a contracting economy and falling demand. The one thing we're not likely to see in the future is a low oil price in the, in the context of an expanding economy and expanding demand. Okay, so just on the basis of global oil supplies and global oil prices, it seems as though we're starting to hit a real limit to further economic expansion. But that's not the only thing that's happening. We also have the global debt crisis. And of course, there's a lot of discussion of this, but let me contextualize it for you with a little story. And the story starts in the early 20th century. Uh, remember, we have cheap oil coming online and, and, and electrification in the early 20th century. These make it possible to produce consumer products in much larger numbers than ever before. Powered assembly lines, so the result is the problem of overproduction. The, the consumers aren't able to soak up all of the products that industry is able to produce. So what's the solution for the problem of overproduction? Well, actually, a few different solutions were found, one of which was advertising, talking people into wanting more stuff than they realized they actually wanted. There were subsidiary strategies like planned obsolescence, making products that reliably broke down uh, 
sooner than they actually needed to so that people would have to replace them or making products so that they would look different from year to year, redesigned, industrial design, uh, <clears throat> so that everyone would want to have the, the, the latest model. Now, this is a 1910 Studebaker. And in 1910, a Studebaker cost $900. Doesn't sound like very much to pay for a new car these days. But in 1910, $900 was a lot of money. So even if people could be talked into wanting these things, these luxury items, not many people could afford to shell out the cash to actually purchase one. So the solution for that was consumer credit. Make it easier for people to go into debt to buy things they couldn't otherwise afford. Consume now, pay later. It was a way of creating more economic growth, and it worked dramatically over the course of the 20th century. Debt increased very substantially. Another thing we did was to de-link money from precious metals. Now, in the early 20th century, money was, was linked directly or indirectly to gold and silver, but there, were, there was only so much gold or silver around at any given time. More could be mined, but it was a slow process. So over the course of the 20th century, in order to make more rapid economic growth possible, money was delinked from gold and silver. Now, there are those who advocate going back to a gold-backed currency. I'm not among those because... Clearly, uh, there, there were problems with, uh, with metal-backed currencies other than uh, uh, the uh, uh, inability of the currency to, to expand rapidly enough, currency supply. Um, there were booms and busts in the 19th century. It was possible for a few wealthy people to control uh, enormous amounts of gold and silver. Not a good idea to go back, but nevertheless, delinking money from precious metals meant that money effectively became debt. And debt is money. So that if, if you go into the bank and take out a loan for $10,000, the banker doesn't scurry off into the vault to find $10,000 that somebody else has deposited there. The, that money is created out of nothing the moment the loan is approved and it appears as a deposit in, in your account. Now, when you pay back the loan, that $10,000 disappears back into the ether. That's quite magical. Okay, so that's, that's enough of that background. Now we have to take our story up to the 1980s. And the, the 80s turned out to have been a crucial turning point in the story of debt and in the story of economic growth in the 20th century. Why so? Well, two items. And the first is explained in this paper by Robert Gordon. And bear with me, because I'm going to, I'm going to describe the contents of his paper as briefly and simply as I can, but I think this is, this is very important. Uh, he suggests that there have been three phases of economic growth during the industrial period. The first phase took place mostly during the 19th century. It was characterized by coal, railroads, and steam power. The second phase took place in the early to mid 20th century, up until around 19, the 1970s and the early 1980s. It was characterized by oil, the technologies that use oil, like automobiles and airplanes, and also electrification and the appliances and machinery that use electricity, everything from electric lights to air conditioners and, and uh, vacuum cleaners and so on. The third phase uh, began in the 1980s and was characterized by the growth of the computer industry, then later on cell phones and the Internet. Now, Gordon shows with very clear data that it was the second of those phases that brought by far the lion's share of economic growth. And that when the, uh, th that second phase hit the point of diminishing returns, where people in the industrialized world had already bought their first automobile and their first air conditioner and, and uh and vacuum cleaner and so on, so that they were only replacing ones that they already had, economic growth began to slow. The, the pace of ec economic activity was high, 
but it wasn't growing as much as it had in previous years and decades. So then the computer revolution sweeps in and new technology comes on the horizon, but the actual amount of economic growth produced by these, these new technologies is fairly minor compared with what went before. Now, the, the meaning of this paper, which Gordon unpacks very, very clearly, is that we can't necessarily assume that more technological change will bring lots more economic growth. What are the new technologies now on the horizon? Well, of course, there are new technologies out there, 3D printing and all sorts of things. We will continue to have new technologies. We're very, a very inventive species. But does that mean that the economy will continue to grow as a result? Maybe yes, maybe no. Gordon argues that the the revolution of oil, oil-fueled transport, and elect electrification may well have been a one-off event in human history. Nothing like it ever before, never will be anything like it ever again. Well, that's not the only thing that happens in the 1980s, the, the, the point of diminishing returns of that second phase. The other thing that happens is the beginning of globalization. Now, this occurs, again, because of technological change, uh, container shipping, satellite communications, computer, computerized monitoring of inventories, and so on. These things enable uh, factories, companies, corporations in the industrialized world to outsource labor, offshore production. So now, Factory workers in places like the United States are, in effect, competing with factory workers across the globe. So this has the effect of capping wages for American workers and those in, in other industrialized countries. So today, an American factory worker, in inflation-adjusted terms, is making about the same as a factory worker did in 1973. So if lots and lots of people in the economy don't actually have much more money in their pockets, but the economy now depends upon consumer spending for growth, and the economy is now addicted to growth, where is that growth going to come from? Well, the answer is more debt. So since 1980, in the U.S. and many other countries, debt has grown faster than GDP. In the U.S., at about three times the rate of GDP. This is a, the result of innovation in the financial industry, <laughs> making it easier for people to go into even more debt with credit cards and student loans and home equity lines of credit and and then building pyramids on, on, of debt on top of, of those things with securitization and derivatives. So it's, uh, it's been extraordinarily effective at maintaining economic growth up to the present. Uh, this, is, this is a picture. Uh, of course, everyone's very excited and exercised these days about government debt, but that's not what we're talking about, actually. As you can see here in the U.S., Government debt during these years wasn't growing any faster than, in fact, was growing slower than household debt. But that changes in 2008. Why so? Well, with the collapse of the housing bubble, suddenly trillions of dollars of value vanish from the U.S. economy almost overnight. And in order to keep the economy itself from deflating, from imploding, the central bank, the Federal Reserve, and the U.S. Treasury step in as the borrowers and spenders and lenders of last resort. And as you can see, then government debt starts to become more of a, uh, a problem in the U.S. Now, what, what actually happened then? It turns out there, there, there was an, a recent audit of the Federal Reserve, first time in its history since 1913 as a result of an act of Congress, and it transpires that the Federal Reserve pumped $16 trillion into the global economy. Now, that's a lot of money. It's, it's considerably more than the annual GDP of the United States. So that's some measure of the scale of this crisis, 
in effect, we were hitting the limits to debt. You know yourself, if you, if you take on so much debt that you can't make the payments on the debt that you have, and the bank doesn't want to loan you any more money, you've, you've reached the end of the road. Well, that's what effectively, I mean, that's a very simplified version, but effectively that's what happened in 2008. This is the picture for New Zealand. And this is the statement of uh, my dear former president uh, at the time. He said, uh, if I may quote, if we don't loosen up some money, this sucker could go down, unquote. Now, by the, the technical term, this sucker, he was uh, actually referring to the U.S. financial system. Uh, and by extension, that of the rest of the world. Well, some money was indeed loosened up, and yet even after more than $16 trillion, because that doesn't count the, the stimulus spending and it doesn't count the $100 billion a month of deficit spending that's ongoing, in spite of all of that, the U.S. economy is still quite weak, uh, in, unemployment is high, and so on. Now, when we hear about bailouts, who's getting bailed out? Uh, are the people of Greece getting bailed out, for example? I mean, uh, their unemployment rate is very high. There's uh, widespread human misery in that, in that unfortunate country. Well, what happens to the bailout money? Well, it goes to the banks. You see, when the, when the banks make a, that loan for $10,000, you will use that same hypothetical situation, uh, if you take out the loan, that's, a, that's an obligation for you to repay. But from the banker's standpoint, that is an asset. Now, what, happened, what has happened in the case of home mortgages in the U.S. and home equity lines of credit and, and lending to some of the southern European countries is that loans were made with the expectation that economic growth would go on and on. And when economic growth stalls, then suddenly a lot of that debt becomes unrepayable. These, these become toxic assets for the banking industry. But rather than having the banking industry write off these toxic assets and banks therefore go bust, central banks are stepping in to loan more money to these countries so that they can make the payments on their existing debt, but then the people of Greece now are having to work six-day weeks and 13-hour days with the hope that somehow they'll be able to pay off even more debt. Is that going to happen? No. At some point along the line, there are going to be enormous defaults. Debt will be written off by the trillions. It's just a question of whether this happens by plan or it happens in emergency or crisis situations. But, of course, the way we're doing it now, by bailing out the bankers and at, at the expense of the general public and future generations, simply leads to social instability, of which we are likely to see more as time goes on. Okay, third end of growth factor, and this is climate change. Now, I'm not, I'm not going to argue that climate change is right now immediately choking off world economic growth, as is the case with high oil prices and limits to debt. However, I will suggest that over the course of this decade, climate change is going to come in as the coup de grace to deliver the final blow to world economic growth. We all know the story. Global carbon emissions are rising. So are global temperatures. Uh, we've already put enough CO2 into the atmosphere that at least two degrees of, of warming is, is inevitable. And with just the warming that we have right now, we're already seeing extreme weather events like the, the drought in the Midwestern United States that's costing uh, billions of dollars in losses to the corn crop. We're already seeing the loss of the polar Arctic ice. Uh, now, this sets in motion a self-reinforcing feedback loop so that as the ice disappears in the summer months, that reveals dark 
water, which absorbs more heat from the sun, which melts the ice faster, which reveals even more dark ocean water even earlier in the season. So that the, the, the north polar ice is going to be gone in summer months altogether, almost certainly by the end of this decade, perhaps even by 2015 or 2016. Uh, that, that self-reinforcing feedback loop will raise temperatures even faster and cause even more extreme weather events. Uh, it's also setting in motion another self-reinforcing feedback, which is the release of methane from uh, tundra, frozen tundra, and also the methane hydrates frozen under the, the ocean floors. Methane, of course, over short time periods, a decade or less, is a hundred times as powerful a greenhouse gas as CO2. So as the methane is released, that more rapidly warms the globe, which causes more methane to melt, which causes the globe to heat faster, and so on. So are, are we ultimately looking at 10 degrees or more? If that's the case, then it's game over. I won't speculate as to what that means, just to say that I think the, the consequences are emerging to be more uh, rapidly appearing than was generally thought even a few years ago. And before the end of this decade, we will see economic consequences from climate change that will be significant enough to choke off economic growth in most countries. So here we are. We've been on a speeding freight train. But it's never going quite fast enough for us. We want it to go a little bit faster this year than it was going last year. We want more returns on our investments. We want our pension funds to grow. We want more jobs. Uh, if Politicians want more tax returns, and that's only going to happen if the economy grows, if it speeds up. But the reality is we live on a finite planet. Now, this should be intuitively obvious to us. Think of this simple metaphor. A, a, a baby hamster grows very rapidly. It doubles its body weight every week for the first few weeks of its life. What would happen if we had a magic hamster that continued doubling its body weight every week for one whole year, 52 doublings? How big a hamster would we have? Would it be a 50-kilo hamster? Would it be a 500-kilo hamster? Well, the New Economics Foundation of London has done the math for us, and it turns out it would be a 9 billion ton hamster. <laughs> That's never has been such a thing, never will be such a thing, because in nature there are limits. But we are trying to become the impossible hamster. Why so? Well, the, the, these innocent-sounding rates of economic growth, one or two or three or four or seven percent per year, sounds so normal, sounds so doable. But that implies a doubling time. It's true of population, too. A, a one percent per year rate of growth is, implies a doubling time of about 70 years. Two percent growth, about 35 years. China's been growing at about 10% per year in some years. That means its economy doubles every seven years. So if you start from year zero, after seven years, China's economy is twice as big. 14 years from when we started, it's four times as big. 21 years from when we started, it's eight times as big. How many times can China's economy double before it reaches fundamental limits? Well, nobody knows the exact answer to that question, but it, the answer may be not even one more time. Okay, so what, is, what does any of this mean for New Zealand? Uh, I would suggest that the... First of all, I'm, I'm a guest in your country. It's not up to me to tell you what you should do with, with your economy. But it, it, it occurs to me as an interested and sympathetic observer that there may be some choices to be made on, on the immediate horizon. Uh, <clears throat> being a, an economy based on resource extraction is often problematic. Uh, I know in, in my country, in the U.S., we have a lot of ghost towns. 
Um, these, these are often places where there used to be, let's say, a silver mine and, uh, and a saloon, and the saloon was doing really well as long as the silver mine was doing well. And then as, as the silver mine starts to peter out, the whole town just kind of uh, dried up and blew away. Well, I've, I'm seeing the same thing happen in resource extractive economies around the world. Uh, first of all, you know, China is not a limitless source of demand for mineral and energy commodities. This is a dilemma also for Australia, which is also banking its future on, on resource extraction and exports. As the economies of U.S. and Europe slow down, stagnate, and start to contract, their demand for Chinese products declines, which then causes Chinese demand for raw materials and energy to level off and maybe in the future decline, which will have an impact on the economy of Australia, perhaps that of New Zealand as well. <clears throat> now, the Australian Resources Minister said this just a few weeks ago. Of course, he was roundly criticized for, for uttering this inconvenient truth. <laughs> but it's already happening. Prices for commodities, for mineral commodities, are already softening because of exactly the scenario I just described to you. What about population? Australia has a very rapidly increasing population. So does New Zealand. You know, if population continues to increase at current rates, that means that there will be more and more people demanding more and more services, even as the economy levels off and contracts. What kind of future does that mean for the next generation and the generation after that? Rather than continuing to pursue growth, I would suggest that we would be much better off pursuing resilience of our economies. Now, what does that mean? Uh, in many ways, resilience is the opposite of economic efficiency. Now, efficiency is an attractive word. After all, energy efficiency is almost always a good thing. But when we're talking about economic efficiency, I, I use a, a simple example to in speaking to my American audiences, and I, hopefully it will translate to you as well. If you can grow corn cheaper in Iowa than any place else, then you should grow all of your corn in Iowa and nothing in Iowa except corn. It makes sense. It's economic efficiency at work. But it's at the expense of the resilience of the food system. Why? Because if the corn crop in Iowa fails, as is happening right now, then nobody has corn and Iowa has nothing. So if you want to have a resilient food system, you want a decentralized food system, and you want to have more inventories and dispersed inventories. That way, if something tragic happens, it's not the end of the world. Well, we have shocks on the way. We have climate shocks. We have economic shocks. It doesn't matter what we do at this point. There, obviously, there, we could be doing better things or worse things, but we've waited too long to avert having any shocks whatsoever. It's baked into the cake at this point. So that being the case, it makes sense to build resilience into our food system, our transport system, our, our financial system, everywhere we possibly can. We are, if what I'm saying is true, we are at a fundamental turning point in economic history. We are at the end of this anomalous period of rapid economic growth that characterized the 20th century. Now, it doesn't mean the end of the world, but it does mean that we're going to have to adapt. And if we adapt proactively, if we adapt with some understanding of the situation we're in, we'll do much better. We could do that, I think, by getting off of gross domestic product as a measure and as a goal for our economies. You know, again, it's just a measure of how much money we spend. We can spend money on good things or we can spend money on things that actually make us miserable and worse off. So if we had a genuine progress indicator or a measure like gross national happiness, which the people of Bhutan have pioneered for the last few decades, that could send us in a much better direction.
if currencies are facing potential disruptions, which may well be the case with the euro, may be the case with the U.S. dollar, maybe other currencies as well, maybe it makes sense to have local currencies as a backstop so that, so that trade can continue on a local level during periods of rapid fluctuation in the value of national currencies. We have corporations that require as their first priority increase on shareholder returns. The first priority isn't providing good employment for workers or good working conditions. It's not providing high quality products and services to customers. The first priority is increasing value to shareholders. That being the case, corporations have to grow or die or be absorbed by other corporations. Maybe that works in a fast-growing economy. It does, it's not going to work well in a non-growing economy. But why not go back to primarily family-owned and worker-owned companies whose priorities can be very different, can be, in fact, providing employment and, and good products and services, and, and continue to function even in times of economic fluctuation. And then shouldn't we think about population stabilization and even population reduction over time? Uh, we obviously need alternative energy sources, solar, wind, geothermal, hydro, micro-hydro, the list goes on and on. But the reality of the situation is that we put off the energy transition too long, and these alternative energy sources do not have the economic qu qualities that oil and the other fossil fuels had in the early 20th century. The sun doesn't always shine. The wind doesn't always blow. I'm not saying we shouldn't develop these sources. Quite the opposite. We should be doing so as rapidly as we can. We will have a renewable energy future, whether we plan for it or not, so we should plan for it. But it's not going to be a, a future of consumerism and rapid economic growth. With transport, for example, we will have a less mobile future. Our current transport system relies almost entirely upon petroleum, of which we will have less. And as a result, we're not, we're not all going to be driving electric cars in 10 years. And we're not going to be flying in airliners with giant batteries. <laughs> they would be too heavy to get off the ground. We will be less mobile. So let's plan for that. Let's, let's plan our cities so that people can get where they need to go by walking or by bicycle. And where necessary, let's provide electrified public transport for them. Same thing with buildings. We, we know how to construct buildings that require no external energy input for heating or cooling. The Germans have, have built about 20,000 of them so, so far. They're called passive houses, the passive house movement. Well, we need to retrofit, redesign our, our building stock for an energy-constrained future. The same thing with our food system. We've created a food system that depends overwhelmingly on fossil fuel inputs. Something like seven calories of fossil fuel energy expended for every calorie of food that we produce and, and process and distribute. That's a food system that's virtually designed to fail under circumstances that are entirely foreseeable. But we have models. There are, there are tens and hundreds of thousands of farms all around the world that operate to sustain.
Thank <laughs> you. 